All right, this is the beginning for Unit 3. Um, or it's actually not even our unit because I do federalism a lot later, but what is in your book is Chapter 3. I cover a lot of things in federalism um, along the way. I will warn you that a lot of things in the federalism are pretty dry, but it is actually a very easy section once you get to know what are the things you have to know along the way. Vocabulary um, that you have different ideas um, along the way. A lot of that we that we'll have here in the beginning is things that we had in, in prior sections. Again, I purposely do that, and I say federalism to another end to come back to things, so it's not nearly as difficult um, that you have. So, first of all, the powers in federalism. Some vocabulary words you need to know, which is on your one pass fail quiz. Uh, there is delegated, reserved, concurrent, prohibited. Delegated are the powers that are specifically given to the U.S. government. Um, these, these can be enumerated, they can be uh, implied in some ways, they can be expressed, that, that you have. Reserved are the powers of the states. Concurrent are shared powers. Prohibited powers, I think that's pretty easy. You'll see a lot of different Venn diagrams showing this. Now, these first couple of slides are what are for your past fail quiz when it comes to the national powers. Most of these are pretty easy, but there are a few that, that you do definitely need to know that are a little bit tricky. Um, chap. So, this is where we have our national powers. Please notice on interstate that it enter is underlined. Um, chap. So, um, most of these are pretty straightforward. Some that we're going to look at when we get deeper into federalism is like the rules for naturalization because this is where, like today, we have cities that claim to be sanctuary cities, but it is the federal government that is charged of immigration um, there. So. Reserve power. These are the powers reserved to the states. These are not listed in the Tenth Amendment the way the Constitution is. This says that if it is not a power given to the national government and not prohibited from the states, then it is a power for, for the states. Historically, some of these things are conduct elections um, that we have. The health, safety, and morals is the one that we will look a lot into because you think Obamacare, the issues of um, same-sex marriage, um, the elections in this last election that we had where there's where states... They, they can be different. It was not unconstitutional that Pennsylvania was different than what Florida did um, there, or that Utah mails out all their ballots where some states you had to request them there. Another thing we see is you notice that normally public schools falls under the states. That is another thing that over time the federal government has, has come into that power more and more. Regulating intra within the state commerce is a state power. Shared powers. This is where you kind of think the enforcement and making of laws that you have, which laws deal with money. A lot of times so they can borrow money, they can have taxes. Um, chartering banks and corporations is kind of tricky um, with, with that one, but this is where different states do different things that you have. Calling out the militia uh, there. This is one that we've see, seen in history. Um, I know I talked about it before with the the and, and after Brown versus Board of Education, where we will have the Central High School in Arkansas that will Little Rock Central High School that will when they will integrate and first of all the 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 Governor Falvis calls out the um, National Guard to stop them, but then because of the supremacy clause, this is where President Eisenhower will take over and and ultimately help those that that came into Little Rock High School. All right, prohibited no matter what. Some of these are listed in the Constitution. Some of these are ones that were added with different amendments, like um, the show. The voting restrictions, what I'm, what, what's meant by that, and this is where, where you can kind of use it as a, the power of federal government. States are in charge of elections, but state of Florida, we cannot deny women the right to vote or certain races to vote. No state is allowed to have perm um, slavery anymore. You might say that always has been. No, it has not. Slavery was in the original Constitution. Remember the three-fifths compromise. You'll see various Venn diagrams. You will see things that are worded a little bit different than what I have listed in there. Just think of different synonyms. We're going to have a worksheet that, say, is eighth grade level worksheet, but a worksheet that we'll do that will have this. All right, here's where there's different things that are guaranteed in the Constitution to, um, for the for the federal government with the states. A lot of these are right there in the preamble. Protect against foreign invasion, protect against domestic um, violence. Um, they are promised to have a Republican form of government where they will have representatives. Geographic integrity, the, 
the United States will not come in and take away part of a state. Now there are certain things in certain states that they could if they decide to, to split. Like Texas actually has it in there and when they came into the, to the United States that they can split into multiple states on there. We know how West Virginia when they broke away from Virginia and then came, came into the United States. All right, this is a repeat for something we had in the very first first unit. Uh, but this is uh, comparative government, but it's comparative government that you have to know the basics of for, for U.S. government and politics. Uh, we currently have a federal system that is the shared power between the central government and the sub-governments on there. So you see states, sometimes you'll see the sub subgovernment. When our country started out in the Articles of Confederation, we had the Confederate, or if you see, Confederal system on um, there. Unitary system is something where all the power is in the, in the central government. It is the opposite of the Confederate, where the power is in the states. A great example of this will be Japan. Um, in Japan, all the, basically the rules for the country are made in um, their, the capital, and the entire country has it. So, if if we were if we were in Japan, your even your local school curriculum, maybe even things like dress code, that is going to be decided by the central government, not your local governments that you have. We've we've had had graphs and you see there on the one that says Unitarian Confederal. The main thing you kind of look at is, and this is where our, our questions come through history of the United States, where you see for the federal government that question of who's truly in charge on what issue when it is the upper government, which would be the United States government, versus the lower government, which is the states. Uh, this goes throughout our history from Essex Junto, Hartford Convention and Nullification Crisis, a little thing called the Civil War, the argument over, over with um, segregation, civil rights movement, even today, Obamacare, legalization of marijuana, um, same-sex marriage, immigration laws, all of these, that's where there's a conflict between, between them. Um, and it, all right, our basics, and here's where you see, a, see a, a definition. I will tell you that historically, that's one of the few definitions that's straight out, that um, sometimes has an AP question on um, there. But you know, you'll know, you usually see something along the lines of sharing the formal authority. Intergovernment relations, the relations between the national sub-government, also state and local that we have. One of the parts that we have, which we'll have our, we'll re, we redo the constitutional parts, uh, past fell quiz, Article 4 with relations with states, Article 6 the Supremacy Clause, the 10th Amendment with reserve rights, the 14th Amendment. Now, when we started learning the 14th Amendment, the simple thing that most of y'all had was civil rights. We're going to see it's a lot more than civil rights um, in here in this section, and that's where it comes in. Indirectly, there's a lot of other parts of the Constitution. The amendment process, judicial appeals, voting, all of those things are indirectly in this. Um, used to be that we, you had to know not just the overall articles, but what, what was in what, what sections of it, with sections 8, 9, and 10 on um, there. You no longer are required to be that detailed in knowing um, this. This is where, where that's not as important, it's more trivial when it comes for the AP exam. But this is where the 8, 9, and 10 tell what powers Congress has, what are prohibited um, there for states, what are prohibited for, for all governments that you have. Article 4, the full faith and credit clause. Uh, what that means is that for, for the first part of it is that, that if you have a contract in another state, it is supposed to be upheld. So if my wife and I got married in the state of Vermont and we moved to Florida, Florida is to recognize that, con that marriage contract we have. Or if you got a driver's license in one state, you can go into another state that you have. Um, there. Privileges and immunities clause. This is where you cannot discriminate against another, another a person of another state. Um, there. So if, if if a crime is done on you in, in one state, they can't say, ah, oh, well, you're from Arizona. We're not going to pursue this. Or if you're pulled over for a speeding ticket, they can't have it where it's an it's a hundred and eighty dollar ticket for someone that's from Florida, but oh, we see you're from Georgia, so it's two hundred and eighty dollars. It's got to be the same. There are some exceptions. The biggest one we'll talk about in class in here is when, when it comes to, to the idea for um, in-state and out-of-state tuition for college. Now, that is not discriminating against people from out-of-state for the simple reason that um, if you go to a public school, it is actually subsidized on um, there. University of Florida is not, a, not nearly as cheap as what you pay in tuition on um, there. There is 
taxpayers are subsidizing it. So if you move from another state, you don't, don't have that. Extradition, this is where each state, they cannot hold a, a criminal. So if I had committed a crime when I was in Utah, um, and the state of Utah requested me there, the, the state of Florida, Citrus County, would then extradite me to Utah. Um, all right, supremacy clause, ultimately the U.S. government is supreme, the Constitution is supreme law of land. Once again, the 10th and the 14th Amendment um, that you have, also all the different reconstruction and voting amendments to an extent. We're going to, you're going to have a lot more about the 10th Amendment as you do your, your close reading um, there. And the 14th and the 4th, um, the Article 4, we're going to have it where you're going to have a worksheet and dig right into it and, and go really deep into Article 4 also. Incorporation for the 14th Amendment is going to pop up a couple different times now and then when we do our judicial branch. Traditionally, basically, the federal government has taken, taken power away from the states. How do they do this? The 13th and 14th Amendments. Um, there. For 13th Amendment banned slavery. So a state used to be able to have states' rights. They could decide no longer could they. The 14th Amendment, there were certain things states had to do in order to come in, as well as protecting civil rights and the due process clause that is there. All the different voting amendments, because voting was supposed to be something the states had, but there were certain things that for federal elections that states must uphold. The 17th Amendment, yes, it gave power to the people, but it took the power away from the state uh, there, because the state legislators chose them, then it was chosen by the people. Who decides ultimately? It is the Supreme Court, the ultimate decision. And had the question asked in class about, well, what if one decides for another? And this is when we get to the judicial branch. Um, wherever that jurisdiction is, that is what is supposed to be followed until it works its way up. And if there's two different jurisdictions that have different rulings, the Supreme Court they usually will hear a case, and then they will make a ruling that will then go for, for the whole United States. An important case to know, your number one case you're going to have to know for, for an AP exam is Marbury versus Madison, but they expected you learn that in fifth and eighth grade um, there. So yes, you go, you'll probably use Marbury versus Madison in one of your writings if you have it, but there, there won't be a multiple choice question for something that easy. Um, your most likely multiple choice questions will come from, will, will be McCullough versus Maryland. So I say this is the second most important um, court case to know for, for AP. You probably learned it in AP U.S. history with stuff with, with about the argument of the the bank after after ha Hamilton had nominated or tried to have the national bank and there was a fight between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans uh, when Maryland was trying to tax the bank. This is what this lawsuit came about. Now there's in two important parts and this is where the two clauses come in. The first part is that Maryland was not allowed to tax the national bank. So a state was not more powerful than the national government. That was straight on to Article 6, the Supremacy Clause. But the other side was, is that they were soon say, and saying there should not even be a bank of the United States. It's not in the Constitution. But under the Necessary and Proper Clause, better known as the Elastic Clause, this is where the Marshall Court had written that, yes, they are allowed to have that. This increases federal power a lot because if, if the federal government is able to do something that is necessary and proper, they're allowed to according to the Elastic Clause. And think, can, how far can this be stretched? Again, that's why the Elastic side that you have. Your number three case of all AP exams that you have to know is Gibbons versus Ogden, which with these cases, this is where it's the power over interstate commerce. 1824, and I'm going to come back to this to this because it's going to be precedent, but this will state the standard. Historically, very simple for what this quiz, this case was about, was the fact that we will have ferries that are crossing from New York and New Jersey. New Jersey says they're in charge. New York says they're in charge. It goes to the Supreme Court. The Marshall Court rules that no, you are not. In, you're in charge since it's interstate between two or more states. The federal government is. And this will set the precedent that if something is traveling across state lines, that the Supreme Court ruled that the Interstate Commerce Clause gives the federal government the power over this. Now, we're going to have these in our review of the court cases when we come at the end, but they are, these are definite ones that you have, have to know um, as we go. So there's a TikTok um, for McCulloch. All right. 
the Dred Scott case. This is one more for history, but it does play into to federalism because before the Civil War, um, this is where where the idea of dual sovereignty, where the states and the federal government had had different different standards, and that, and each state had a little bit more of what they can do. But there, the problem that we had is when this officer will go into a free territory and then a free state, and when the slave will sue to be free. Um, there and then he's not allowed to, to, to sue and pretty much says there, it, there really isn't a thing called free and slave in there. And so the national power was, was decreased um, in this way because they couldn't ban it in the territories there um, that you would have. All right, nullification in history starts out with the Virginia Kentucky resolutions when Thomas Jefferson and James Madison write these that they are, they are against the Alien and Sedition Acts that the Federalist Party had made in, in the late 1700s. The issue is going to come up again in the tariff issue where Calhoun will say that for Andrew Jackson that they can't have. Now, for nullification, they said that, that a state cannot uh, or is allowed to basically nullify or not follow a federal law, which was saying that states were more powerful than the federal government. It is not true. This is where we find in history. The ultimate thing of nullification will be secession, which we have a thing called the Civil War that will occur. We have it happen currently, and this is where you can kind of think of nullification with the immigration, where we have sanctuary cities that are saying they're nullifying federal laws. We've had states that have said they're going to nullify um, Obamacare or different gun laws that, that you have. So. This is where, for nullification, it is used a lot, but it actually is not a constitutional principle uh, that, that can be followed. All right, a court case you need to be familiar with because this, is, this set the standard that was for, for pretty much um, uh, about 100 years, okay, until about 1932-33. And this is where we're going to have dual federalism, and in our next section of notes, we'll go over the difference between dual federalism and cooperative federalism. Um, here, but the dual federalism is supported by Barron versus Baltimore, which said there is there are two levels um, that, that that you have, and and if you think of layer cake, and this is where it's called layer cake federalism, this is you you kind of know what the different layers. That's the state, that's the national. There aren't a whole lot of that are in between. That will be where we will have for for over the first hundred and I don't know, close to 150 years of our country. One thing that will be a major case, and this is, you know, oh wow, Mr. Bass, that's in big letters, underlined, bolded. Yes, incorporation doctrine, and we'll come back and we'll have readings on incorporated cases. The first one, Get Loud versus New York, will be the first incorporation case. What it means to incorporate something is the federal government tells the states that they must uphold something in the First Amendment. So the first time was in Get Loud where they must uphold the freedom of speech. Loosely what was happening before was you had freedom of speech if you were speaking out or against the federal government, but you didn't have it for speaking out against the state there, in this case state of New York, or doing something different to the state's hat. So this is where we, when we incorporate it. When we get to our judicial side, this is where we have a lot of interesting cases of things that have been incorporated, whether it be the Fourth Amendment, one of our most recent ones was the part about excessive fines and bails, and the Eighth Amendment that has been done in the last few years by the Supreme Court. Um, a lot of these cases were by the Warren Court in the 50s and the 60s, early 70s um, that you have. Here's where we kind of take two different concepts together, and this could be something that, that might be not really an AP question, but a thinking question. So. What would Jefferson and other anti-federalists think about the incorporation doctrine? In this, you have to know what do anti-federalists, the people that were against the Constitution as written, what do they believe in, and then you have to know the incorporation doctrine. You can write either way, you just have to back it up. So it's kind of your argumentative essay. So you could say that they would like it because they supported more liberties, they didn't think the Constitution had enough liberties, so the fact that the states have to support the liberties. But you could also write on the other side because the anti-federalists were also concerned about the amount of federal power for the central government had. So you could say that they, were, they would be upset because the federal government is then telling the states what to do. All right, for our cases, what will be actually, I would say, your fourth and fifth most important cases are Brown versus Board and Heart of Atlanta Motel, which are connected to, to Plessy versus Ferguson. These are ones where history for the civil rights comes in and it falls in with federalism. Um, 
for schooling then this, this is the one well, the first place the federal government starts doing more and more and when it comes to local schools will be when they with Brown versus Board of Ed, Education when they will um, try to stop segregation then we have in restaurants um, here the Heartland Motel is um, will take the precedence of the school but then take it to more for different businesses now you should already know Plessy and Brown for from history we will come back to these in our civil rights section of which is our, our very last chapter we do heart of Atlanta motel though this is where the federalism comes in how did the US government in 1964 which is also the year the 1964 Civil Rights Act passed so this will support the Civil Rights Act passed uh, that was passed that year and it'll support that you cannot segregate um, here so a motel could not segregate this goes back all the way back to that 1824 case of Gibbons versus Ogden. The Warren Court will say the U.S. government is in charge of interstate commerce because the Commerce Clause gives them that power. So the federal government is over to, over states for, for um, because of the the interstate commerce clause. Well. What's interstate about a motel? It could be the travelers. They also said that restaurants could have either the customers or the food that's interstate. This will broaden the power of the federal government. The Interstate Commerce Clause and the Elastic Clause were used a lot in the, the 50s, 60s, 70s to expand even up into the early 80s to expand the power of the federal government over states. And that will be a trend. And again, this is where you can see where I mean, you could almost say anything could possibly be interstate commerce. So this this keeps going on on that side. Um, I'll come back to judicial federalism in a little bit, but United States versus Lopez will stop that side of of the constant expansion with the interstate commerce clause because in the U.S. versus Lopez, which is in one of your close readings that you have to answer um, in here. What happened was the United States Congress made a, a law saying that everywhere would have gun-free school zones. And they said the reason why they're doing that is because pretty much guns are interstate commerce. And the Supreme Court had come back and said, yeah, that's taken a little bit too far um, there. So even though like most places do have gun-free school zones like that, that you have, that was not something that the power of the, of the federal government to do. So you see that that kind of stops some of that expansion of the of the um, of the use of the interstate commerce clause the college board loves this court case the Obamacare ruling here's where a lot of people thought in 2012 that it would be that the reason why it was upheld was interstate commerce because that had been common it wasn't um, here's where Justice Roberts was the deciding vote and he will rule in favor um, of the federal government because and we'll use that the, the Congress has the right to tax because there was a fee if you did not pay uh, or if you did not have Obamacare. For the Oberfeld versus Hodges case, which the College Board also has here, this is where you can see the other way around because what happened was where states, states that had laws that did not allow same-sex unions, the federal government in 2015 said that does not count. Um, in 2002 or 2004, the state of Florida, we passed an amendment to our Constitution that said marriage was only between a man and woman, but because of the Oberfell case there, that was where in 2015 that was no longer allowed. Now, judicial federalism, what has happened is with our courts, it started with Reagan, a little bit with, with both Bushes, Bill Clinton did some, but Obama and now Trump had done a lot more. We don't know since we're early in Biden's term. I have a feeling Biden will probably continue what, 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 what Obama did. But what we found was in a lot more polarization in the in the federal courts, because Reagan had, had said, well, instead of just picking someone that's a good person to be a judge, it was a lot more ideological in their pick. So Republicans have been picking more and more more judges that are approved by the Federalist Society um, there, which is they see to see how conservative they are. Meanwhile, we have Democrats that are picking more and more liberal. And so this is a trend that we have had for the last 40 years or so. Um, Trump had continued that when he was um, in office. Actually, this is where for a lot of Republicans that don't like Trump, the one thing that they do like is the fact that not just three Supreme Court justices, but he was able to, to have in a four-year period, I believe, the most judges, um, which are all lifetime appointees, that he was able to appoint to the courts um, there. You'll notice that there's a lot of different cases. Notice this one that both 
United States versus Hodges is a case that is on that question. Um, you hear um, Commerce Clause, we're going to get to mandates here. Federalism, Selective Incorporation, we're going to see again uh, for these things that you have. Continuing on to, for this one, this is a short one. All right, the general idea for the history side of this is the federal government has gained more power over time. Um, in here. So this is where the states have lost power, the federal government ha has gone. A lot of this is be um, because of selective incorporation um, there, because states were not protecting basic rights. Also, when you think of things when it comes for segregation, other laws. All right, this is something that used to go a lot deeper in, but we don't have, we don't, the, the College Board doesn't expect quite as deep on it, but you still have to know more. The term dual federalism or layer cake federalism, even if you were taking regular government, you would have to know that. And what it is is that narrow relationship between the states and federal governments, again, the different layers of the cake that you have. Now, you'll notice here that I say for our bracketing dates, if you go back to our history, 1789 to the Constitution to 1865. If you're a regular level, we would jump that all the way to 1932. For AP, you're going to have a little bit where we have some changes along the way, which is dual sovereignty. So after the Civil War, we're going to have this little fight on there. The states are going to say they have more power with Jim Crow laws. The federal government will have more power to states with the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. So we have this fight of, of, with each other. Cooperative federalism starts 1932. That is the election of FDR. This will be where there's a lot more expansion of the federal government's power. Those New, new Deal programs, my, the alphabet soup programs, will have it. You see this? This is where cooperative um, federalism is also called marble cake. So we have layer cake where it's a state that's federal on there. The marble cake, it kind of blends in with each other a lot more. Now, if you, again, if you were in a regular level, that year would go on to 1968 because there. But for, for, a, for the AP side, cooperative federalism goes on steroids for a few years. When the Great Society programs were around, we will expand mightily the power of the federal government um, here. And this is why we're saying cooperative federalism on steroids. Um, the different programs we have, the Housing and Urban Development, Department of Transportation, Medicaid, all the different welfare programs. So the war on poverty. And right now we're not going to go into the, the good and bad, bad of that. We'll look, we'll look in more on the policy side when we're doing the policy um, unit and see with that. But this is where the federal government is going to come a lot more into um, the state's business. 1968, Nixon will change. Now, Nixon, which was conservative at that time, probably wouldn't even be able to be elected by, by Republicans today um, in there, but this is where he will not try to change everything that has been done, but what he will do is he'll actually, with new federalism, um, try to give more power back to the states. And then we will have in the 1990s and 2010s, teens, we will have even more that the, what's called devolution. Um, along the way. And this is where and where the, the contract with America um, and the Tea Party movement against Obamacare in the 2010s, again, the backlash kind of going um, against, against um, the federal government. What we have seen since 68 is the federal government will expand, but there is a pushback against us. So it's kind of gone back and forth along the way. And we have this fight and we have a lot of these little controversies. Again, Obamacare in the last 10 years has probably been the biggest that, that you have um, up here. All right, judicial federalism, talked about just a little bit ago from our last section, but this is where the idea of more of things that are done by the courts and where we have it, where they are more politicized. Um, again, Reagan started it where he would, would um, appoint a lot more conservative judges and then we will have, have Obama that does an extreme side on the other way um, there. Progressive federalism, this is something, and, and I know in today's term, a lot of time we see progressive and you think liberal. This really isn't. What this actually does is we'll, we'll and, and you see that term, encourage lab, laboratories of democracy. The federal government will say, you've got to do things, but we'll give the states a little bit more freedom to do it. Um, even though you see progressive, you think liberal, it isn't, it's, this is actually a lot of times Republicans that, that will do this. Um, Bill Clinton as a Democrat was one that would do this, but so was George W. Bush. The biggest example you're going to see with this is when we get to the different grants for block grants that we have. Okay, I say since 48, how's the issue of health care been an example of continuing argument of state local powers? I could actually go back to the 1930s because that's when the idea of national health care was first introduced. 
48 was when it was was actually trying to make the bill and part of the fair deal for Truman. That is why Democrats tried for so long, and when they finally were able to pass it in 2010, they would. But it's not it's not the same as what what you would um, see in other countries. Um, all right, this other part, this is I'll kind of explain this in, in class. This was for a review. I had a student, a past student of mine, that made a really good analogy about how how basically the maturing couple and relationship side of this. She did a lot better than I have, but I'll try to do it in class, but I won't waste time on film for this. All right, for that cooperative federalism, starting with the New Deal, the way that the federal government could push the states to do certain things is using money um, in here. Great society programs will do even more than the New Deal. And one thing that, that would happen in here is, is, especially with FDR, you would bypass the state governments, go directly to the local governments and groups. Say, so why would you do that? Well, there's, you can look at it different ways. Um, and this way would try to, to get away from any waste or fraud. There might already be in the state government. Some of it on the political side um, there, because you think with the New Deal programs, FDR is a Democrat, so areas that, that were Republican, um, he could get it to the higher urban areas, which also voted more, more Democrat. Physical federalism, when you see fiscal, this is with money. So, how does uh, what's the biggest influence the national government has over the states? Money. They, uh, they will tell the states, you must do this if you want certain money. How do states get the money for different things? One thing that has happened is devolution um, here, which is, again, since the 70s, where I recently said from like 68, starting with Nixon, but we will have, have over time more and more programs the states have to do, but this is where money that is given. Now we're gonna see a little bit that not always is money get, given to us. So one thing that's made in these grants are discrimination clauses. And this is a way that they, they can make sure. So money coming to Citrus County schools um, would be stopped if we decide to do segregation. Or this is where Title IX, when it comes for gender. So that is a way that, this, that the federal government was able to make their power in different states. Okay, there are four different type of grants that you need to know the name of it. The first one is on there, and they're actually pretty easy, but you need to know which are. A category grant, it is for a specific, specific thing. So, if we are going to have a, a grant that is going to go, and the whole purpose of it was to try to, uh, to bring money to Citrus County so that we can have more um, control over mosquitoes because of uh, the encephalitis outbreak at times. So it's a certain county, a certain thing, you get money for that. A project grant is a lot of times an earmark up here. This is where you may have a bridge or a moped museum that's being built on there. Or for like the science, a certain experiment uh, that you have. And what you do is you bid out in order to get the money and you have to meet the certain federal gu guidelines but then it, that it is given to that area um, that you have. A formula grant's pretty straightforward. There's a formula that you have. There's a lot of things for schools. We have, we have certain schools um, in Citrus County that get more money because they have a higher percentage of um, students that are in the free and reduced lunch. So they get extra money for some extra teachers or more money for the preschool programs that they have in here. A block grant is something that's been really popular in the last couple decades. The idea of a block grant, which was, was something the Republicans liked, but so did Bill Clinton um, there um, as a Democrat, but the block grants would say, well, let's give a chunk of money to local governments um, and not have so many guidelines to it. And you figure out what's the best way to use this money. Again, there aren't very many restrictions like you would have in a project grant or a category grant. Um, it has been for the 90s and the early 2000s, but what has happened, and you will see this term on AP exams, creeping categorization. So what's happening now is that it's not truly a category grant, it's not truly a block grant. You'll have a block grant that says, you can do what you want as long as it deals with X, Y, and Z. So here's $2 million, but it must be used on construction projects or it must be used on an environmental project. So they, they don't tell exactly what environmental project, but they are again, and that's the creeping categorization in here. Um, I'm going to just skip this for here because that's another question. All right, a mandate. What a mandate is, is, is it is something that, that the federal government tells the states they must do. Okay, so usually you have a mandate and you say you must do this and normally the federal government will pay a certain amount of money. Medicare is actually an example of that. 
Um, every state has to have a, sorry, Medicaid is a, an example of that. Every state has to have a, a um, Medicaid system. But the federal government gives a certain amount of money. Now the states have to do at least certain things and then each state can do more of this. Now, what do you think an unfunded mandate is? Yes, it's a mandate that the states are told what to do, but there is no money given. These are the most controversial because the states say, we can't pay for this, but you're telling us that we must do this. There are certain ones of these that you need to know in here. So the federal government, it passes law, states must do. So I'm gonna go over some of these examples like the Americans with Disability Act and, and things and like that. All right, the Americans with Disability Act was passed in 1990. It, the ideas are great. Whenever you have a public uh, facility, if it's, when, if it's built new or if you're redoing it, you have to make sure that money is provided for people with disabilities. Um, here at our historical museum, when they, were, when they redid it, um, this is where they did not have a ramp. They actually, if you go over there, you'll see there's like this little elevator to go up to two steps. Um, yeah. You're not allowed to visit the third story because they do not have an elevator that goes to the third floor. It only goes to the second floor. So they, that is part of what happens. Um, right here in the hallway here at school, you will notice that in the bathrooms that, that, that you'll, you'll notice that, that, that the doors for the stalls are a little bit different. Some are very narrow, some are made bigger. Well. You had to have some that were handicapped accessible, so what they did is when they were redoing this hall, actually 16 years ago, um, they redid the bathrooms. That's where they had to make at least one of them that was big enough for handicapped accessible that they didn't move the toilets or anything, so they just made the other sides that were smaller. Um, so. All right, the Clean Air Act. Another thing that the states had certain requirements they had to do, there was no money that was given for, for the states to help or businesses to, to go and, and with these regulations. The Brady Bill. Now, a lot, of this, a lot of that was done at that time was something that was later on declared unconstitutional for different reasons, but yeah, but what ended up happening is this was for background checks. Yes, in 1997 or in the 1990s, there, here's where we're saying we need to do more net background checks. So, yeah, history hasn't really changed a whole lot in, in over two decades. But this is what this did is after Brady, who was um, on the Reagan administration, who suffered a, a wound that was then paralyzed for the rest of, rest of his life um, and had some brain damage um, on the assassination attempt of Ronald Reagan. That's who was named after for him. But this is where there was supposed to be more background round checks. States, local governments had to do this, but there was no funding for it um, here. So, yes. All right, some questions to ponder. What has happened over the years with local controls of schools? This is a great example of how we will have, and this is where No Child Left Behind come, comes around, where federal government originally wasn't. The first thing the federal government really steps in for schools will be with the segregation issue. Also later on then with things for funding and with the Great Society programs. Um, that's yeah. So you think free and reduced lunches, different standards that, that states have to have, but not to mention like sports with Title IX. Why can federalism be seen as more democratic? Well, there's all kinds of ways that people can get involved. Um, it's not just at the national level um, there. And if you see a problem, you can try to go at different levels, uh, national level, local level, state level, um, schools. Okay, this is where you have all the different side in here. How does federalism make government more inefficient? Well, we have this in the bureaucracy. Sometimes you're duplicating things in there. Um, we have a federal department of environmental protection. We have a Florida department of environmental protection. Do we really need both of them when they're both protecting the environment um, there? So, um, so again, this is where, yes, it's more democratic because there's more places you can see, but again, things are duplicated also. How does the federalism help the two-party system to survive? This goes back to our election side. You can have an election where where the one where a Democratic Party does really good and Republicans didn't do good in the national election, but they might, but they're always staying alive because you have the state. So, so pretty much it, it, you can always find some things in there. And 2016, it was a bad bad election for the Democrats, but they still won a lot of mayor campaigns um, that you have. Um, 20, 2020 was not as good of a year for Republicans, but they still controlled different state houses. So this is where you, you always have that side. Again, you see some of the different questions. We will come back to it, see more of these things, but you notice right there, block grants on something. Supreme Court decisions, that you have. Um, category of grants, federal mandates, block grants, 10th Amendment um, in here. 
Elastic Clause, American Disability Act, Civil Rights Act 64, Clean Air Act, block grants, federal mandates.